This is Pastor Alan Cleveland here, and it is a joy to be able to explore God's Word together as we see how God is making all things new. As we start into this new series that we're calling Dry Bones, uh, and we're going to be looking at a valley, and a valley that is full of dry bones for a very explicit purpose, and we've been praying and preparing for this for quite some time because we want to be uh, captivated by the scene that the prophet Ezekiel uh, puts out there uh, in this vision, recording this vision that God placed upon his heart because I am struck how easy it is to pop it into neutral. We can't do that. We, we have to keep a clear vision and a, and a sharp understanding of, of what God is calling us to do. What, what needs to fuel our passion is, is, this, is this understanding of a question that God is going to pose to us today. What do you believe I can do? So let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 37, and I'd like to read the first 14 verses of this vision that God gave to the prophet. And we read this. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on those slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you up from your graves, O my people, and I will put away my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I I will place you in your own land then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Now, if you've ever engaged with the Old Testament, and you flip through the pages, you know, you might recognize some of the Accounts in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the accounts of the Exodus and all of that. And, and, and then you might even, if you flip through, you get into the kings and the history of Israel and you see names like David and Solomon. You might be familiar with that. But then eventually you work your way after the Psalms into these books that are often referred to as the prophetic books. And they're called the prophetic books because it's the prophets who composed them, that wrote them, that recorded God's word to his people. And and quite honestly, a lot of people lose it right about there because as you read through the prophetic books, there's a lot of woe. 
There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of heaviness in it all. And not fully appreciating what's been going on, we, we can easily brush over it and, and, and not really hear what God is actually saying in these books. You see, these, these books were written during a time of desperation, during a time in which the life situation, the people of Israel found themselves, as well as men like Jeremiah and Daniel and, and Ezekiel, they were all about the same time, these prophets speaking to the people of Israel. They found themselves in a difficult, difficult situation. The situation being that invading armies had come in and either destroyed their cities or captive, uh, took people captive and took them back to the countries from which they came from, the invading armies, that is. Uh, it was a difficult time such that Ezekiel remembered the city of Jerusalem coming from a family of priests and was probably trained to serve as a priest before he was carried off by the victorious Babylonian armies many miles from his home. So as you read through the book of Ezekiel, some of it will sound like it's right there in the streets of Jerusalem because, well, probably was written when he was right there in the streets of Jerusalem. But then also, there's a distant sound to it all. And it would be those times in which he'd been moved as an exile, as a refugee. And this chapter we're looking at today is part of that latter part of his experience. In other words, it was part of that time when he is not in his home country. Indeed, he's far away from it. And indeed, he's heard that the city that he, that he loved, that he grew up in, was totally de- devastated by the Babylonian army. And that the temple that he had trained to serve as a priest in had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And so it's with all this news that he's living life. And and so this vision that he experiences in chapter 37 comes at one of the lowest points in the history of his people and in many ways in his own story. Because as he's standing there and he's and he's looking out at the at this valley filled with bones and and if we could pick up the emotional nuances, the emotional undertow of the of the the Hebrew wording here. It's not just a reporting, yes, I was in a valley of dry bones. He was saying, I was in a valley, and there were bones piled upon bones. There were piles and piles of bones. It was overwhelming scene to, to behold. And the bones had been there for a long time because they were white and sun bleached. And the area was just showing of total devastation and, and death and no hope. You know, frankly, a a few of us can relate to this experience. Some of us are involved with organizations like World Relief, and we're driving around people who, due to political turmoil or religious persecution, have been cast out of their home. As a matter of fact, we have people here who come uh, from countries where a husband and a son were lost to a knock on the door at night and they've never been seen again. And the home was devastated and people were forced out of their home and into a refugee camp and finally made it here. So for those of you, that's your experience. You can really relate at a at a different level than than the majority of us can to what to what Ezekiel is portraying here and his experience and background. You can say from firsthand experience, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. Now for most of us, our situation isn't that desperate, but oh, we remember those times when we found ourselves in a valley and all we saw around us was 
was desperation and hopelessness. You know those moments when you ask those questions, those questions that keep coming and they they keep pounding at you and, and banging on your heart. How can any good come out of this situation? What's, what's the point of what I'm going through now? How can God possibly be working in this situation? And it brings us to that question that, that God asks Ezekiel as Ezekiel's looking around him and he's just overwhelmed by these piles and piles and piles of dead bones that he sees. And, and he says, son of man, can these bones live? Can these dry bones live? And on the surface, the answer is obvious. Dry bones cannot. They just sit there in the sun, decomposing a little bit more each and every day. There's no life in them whatsoever. And so when God asks Ezekiel this question, well, you see how Ezekiel responded. It's kind of like a loaded question. You, you know what a loaded question is, right? When somebody says, you're not really going to eat that last piece of pie, are you? That is a loaded question. You're not going to leave the gas tank low in these cold temperatures, are you? That's a loaded question. And those are silly examples of loaded questions, but those are things we experience uh, every day. This was a question that is, was probably the furthest from Ezekiel's mind. Of all the questions God could have asked, could the, can these dry bones live? And so Ezekiel, all he could say is, Oh, Lord God, uh, you know. You know, what kind of response could he really give? Because from his estimation, everything was dead, everything was barren, everything was without any indication of life, everything was without hope. But God asked that question to start to drive the message home that indeed dry bones don't live, but God does. And that's the point here, that he's driving home. No, these dry bones cannot live in and of themselves. They're dead. They're barren. There's nothing they can do. They're just there. They're inanimate. There's no life in them whatsoever. But I can. You you read through this, and, and if you ponder this, and I'd encourage you to read through Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37 at some point in preparation for the weeks to come, you, God is driving home this message. For we see that These bones didn't do anything to deserve God's attention. And yet, he plops Ezekiel down there and he says, you know, these these bones don't deserve anything, but I'm going to work. God initiates the work. It's called grace. It's something that isn't deserved, but it's given anyways. And, And he works. And he initiates that work by looking at Ezekiel and saying, okay, Ezekiel, this is what I want you to do. You prophesy, and I'm going to work through what you say. I'm going to initiate the work. And so God does. And in his initiation, God gives life. The bones come together. We saw it here, or we heard it here in the description. The bones come together. The sinews come together. The flesh comes together. And then God gives life. He says, prophesy again. Call for breath to come into them. And and Ezekiel does. And so all of a sudden, he stands up, and and this army stands up of of people. and, And then God doesn't leave it there. He doesn't just instill life in them, but he calls them to into relationship with himself. We saw it in these last few verses of this passage that I just read. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it. And later on in that same chapter, he's 
he's driving this point, point home, and he says, my dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Ezekiel, son of man, can dry bones live? What do you believe I can do? And over these next few weeks, we're going to be unpacking this more for, in, in several different ways. Right? You know, God asking that question of you and me, be, stretching us to explore. When he looks at us and he says, what do you believe I can do in your community? What do you believe I can do in your families? Oh, community church. Out on Riff Road, community church, New City, community church, Winter Haven. What do you believe I can do in your church? Now, the vision that Ezekiel witnessed and, and shared powerfully anticipated that God was the one who, as he promises all the way back in Genesis and all the way through to the book of Revelation, he promises that he is the one who makes all things new. And, and later in this chapter, Ezekiel anticipates and declares that there is one coming who is the focused fulfillment of all the promises of God. And as he looked forward, the Apostle Paul also looked back and declared that God's plan and purpose came together in the person of Jesus Christ. I don't know if the Apostle Paul, when he wrote about who Jesus is and what he accomplished, had in the back of his mind this vivid picture from Ezekiel chapter 37. It could have very well be. But we see some similar themes coming out if we go to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm, I want to read for you from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And, and just listen for these themes to be coming out. Starting in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Did you hear the parallels? Right there in verse 1 and you were dead in your trespasses, in your sins. Oh, sure, you were breathing, you were living each day, you were kind of walking about, but your heart was hard towards me. Your heart was dead to spiritual realities. Your heart was therefore unresponsive because it was dead. You were dead. You could not respond to me. And if I were to leave you there, but God didn't. That's what we see here in Ephesians chapter 2, that though we were dead, God initiates again. You look down at verse 4, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with 
Christ. God initiated the action. Even when we were dead, even when we were running away, even when we shook our fist at him in defiance and said, I'm going to do it my way. God initiated contact with us. God, in his love, in his mercy, in his grace, sent Christ for his people, for you, for me. He initiated that action, and in initiating that action, he gives life to his people through Christ. That what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross in his death, in his burial, and on his resurrection on that third day made us alive together with Christ, and he calls us into relationship with him. You look at verse 7, so that in the coming ages we might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, that he calls us to, to be part of his family, that he calls us that one day we would, we would be a, a testimony to what he does in bringing the dead to life in doing that work of taking dry bones and giving them life so they can walk and respond and live with him and for him to his honor and to his glory. Now, for most of us in this room, we know this to be true because we look over the vista of our lives and we see how God has worked. And even if we are in a bleak moment now, you know, we don't like what we're going through. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't, it just, it's difficult, it's hard, but we have hope that even in the midst of the hard times, we've seen what God has done, and we believe that he's going to continue to do a work in us. So we have hope in that. And and when the question is asked, and God looks at us, what do you believe I can do? Even in that situation you may not like in the moment, We can say, God, you made these dry bones live. And so, therefore, I will trust. Now, I would say, as I know many of you, most of you, I know you have that that relationship with Christ where you can recount your story, I can recount my story. And can, Yes, I remember a time when I was dead and dry and a just bleached out pile of bones, but God brought life to me, and I'm now one of his kids. Many of us can share those stories, but maybe you're here today thinking thoughts that you've never thought before. You know, you, you hear this account of Ezekiel 37, and, and, and within your heart... You're you're feeling things inside that maybe you've never felt before. And actually, in your heart, there's a small stirring that's increasing and getting louder and, and shouting out to you, this is truth. You need to respond today. You can't put it off. you got to respond today. There's something happening, and it must be God who's the one at work taking care of this heart and transforming it. You know, you can go back to Ezekiel chapter 36, and you see this verse here, this promise here in verse 26, and I will remove the heart of stone that was dead to God from your flesh, and I'll put in you a heart of flesh that responds to me. That's the promise, and that's the promise for you today. That if you are here and... A lot of this sounds new, but there's something stirring inside of you. I'm going to ask you to to do something today. Uh, If our worship team can come up and prepare to lead us in one more song. If you're sensing that God's doing a work in your heart today and, and, and taking you from one who's running away from him, one who is in all manners dead to him, and he's bringing you to life. As we sing this final song, I'm, I'm going to be in the back, and, and, and I just want to, I want to talk with you. I want to share with you more about what Jesus Christ accomplished for you and what he did. 
so that he might take those who are dead and bring them to life. And not just have them standing up and and breathing, but to have intimate relationship with God. And so, you know, as we're singing this song, you just come on back and let's talk, let's pray. We could even go into another room and talk and pray. But don't put it off. If you're if you're experiencing that sensation, if you're experiencing that call, if you're hearing that voice calling out to you, act today. Come alive today, not by anything that you've done, but what God has done for you and is doing for you today. Would you stand with me? And let's pray together. Father, wow, what a powerful passage this is. And oftentimes we can look at our life situations and be overwhelmed by what we see, by what we behold. But Lord, the promise of your word is that you are at work in the lives of your people. And maybe today you're working in someone's heart in a new way, in a way they've never experienced before. And you're calling them to yourself, oh God, may they act on that in this very moment. That as we sing about you being the one that brings death to life, you being the one that rescues those who are lost, that, Father, today they would experience a new heart, a new life, a new relationship with you through faith in Jesus. Oh, and for all of us, as we leave this place this day, oh, may our eyes be ever aware to look out and to see the land as it is, the people of the land as it is. And would you instill within us a passion and a desire to declare words of life to dead people. And in that declaration, see your hand work, bringing those dry bones into relationship, a vibrant, living relationship with you. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.